Linux is 32 years old, or at least it will be in a few months. And during this long history, there have been a lot of defining moments, but also a lot of defining projects. So today we'll look at some of the most influential projects that helped make Linux the awesome thing it is today. And of course, these are just the projects I could think of. If you have others in mind, write me a nice comment, just like I wrote you a nice little poem. Now, just kidding, it's a segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host, from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab, or Grafana, to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim, and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details, and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. And we can't begin this video with anything other than GNU, which is a core part of all our Linux-based operating systems. Well, most of them. Yeah, some Linux distributions don't use the GNU tools, like Alpine Linux, but most do. The GNU project was started by Richard Stallman all the way back in 1985, with the main goal of promoting free software and providing an alternative to proprietary software that was spreading like wildfire. GNU means GNU is not Unix, which is one of these weird recursive acronyms that will make your head hurt if you think too much about it. While GNU was on point for the operating system related tools like a C compiler, text editor, email program, and a lot more, they basically had rewritten all the components Unix had. They definitely did not manage to make a usable kernel, the part that actually lets the tools you have access to interact with the hardware. GNU heard never took off, and even today it sees a fraction of the contributions Linux has, and it's definitely not usable by most people. But the fusion of GNU and Linux gave us what we use today. Linux needed some operating system tools, and GNU needed a kernel, so it was a match made in heaven. They both shared the same approach to software, believing that it should be shared openly, so people can contribute, redistribute, modify, fork, and generally make software their own, something embodied by the GPL, the GNU General Public License, which makes all these freedoms available, but also prevents ill-intentioned actors from taking the code and making it proprietary in their own products. And that's why technically we should say GNU slash Linux or GNU Linux instead of just Linux. They both are important parts of the OS. But this ship has sailed a long time ago, and at that point, why not also add X11 or Wayland, Systemd, Gnome or KDE into the mix? They're equally as important. Now, Slackware is not the very first Linux distribution that was created. This honor goes to an unnamed one, distributed on two floppies by H.J. Lou. But Slackware is the oldest Linux distribution that still exists today. It started a mere two years after the initial publication of the Linux kernel and it had about 80% market share up until the mid-1990s. But that shouldn't really matter because it's not that popular today, right? So what was its contribution to Linux exactly? Well, it's the distro that put Linux on the radar for people who were tired of Unix. I won't go over the Unix wars again, I already made a video about how Linux supplanted Unix, it's linked in the description below. But Slackware was the first credible alternative to using one of the multiple of Unix versions on a server. And people noticed. It was stable, it was reliable, and it followed the Unix principles closely. And today, Slackware is pretty much the same as it was back then. It never caved to package managers that handle dependencies, or to graphical installers, or systemd. It's meant for users who make a decision on every little thing and don't want any simplification of anything. Which is also why it's not a distribution that will appeal to everyone. It's way more complicated to handle than your regular Ubuntu or Fedora. But it's still alive today, 
and it even got a release in March this year. Okay, now something you might not know about, Yggdrasil Linux. It was another Linux distro with its first alpha version released at the very end of 1992. And what makes it special is the fact that it was the first to bring a live CD to Linux. Something we take for granted today. We slap an ISO onto a drive, we boot from it, we can try it out and see if things work. But at the time, this did not exist. You had to install the distro before you could check how it worked for you. Yggdrasil really was the root of how we envision Linux installs today. And it even branched out into fully live distributions, like Tails. But they must have been barking up the wrong tree because it ceased operating in 2004, the poor saps. Okay, I'll stop with the tree pun and I leaf now. And we also have to talk about eggs.org. This thing is what powered the graphical part of Linux, the visual elements you can interact with for most of its existence. And it is still used by millions today, even though Wayland is taking its place bit by bit. Yes, yes it is, Wayland is wonderful, but also it lacks a few features that X has and had for most of its life. X started in 1984 and it works on a client and server model, with the client being what draws the shapes on your screen and the server communicating with the graphics card and display and sending instructions to the client or the clients. Linux started using X.org, then known as X386, in 1994. Without X386 or X.org as it became known after a bunch of splitting, forking, merging and whatever else, it was a mess, without it, we probably would not have had Linux as we know it today because developers would have had to write a complete display server from scratch, which would probably have taken a lot of time and Linux might have missed its shot. Now, we also have Red Hat and SUSE, and I'm lumping these two distributions in the same category because their influence is the same. They were the first commercial Linux distributions that proved that yes, you could combine open source and making money. And yes, Linux could be a successful product. Red Hat's first version was published in 1995, and it brought with it the RPM packaging format, which was pretty much the de facto standard until Ubuntu took the world by storm and popularized the Debian packaging format. Back when I started with Linux in 2006, it was not uncommon to only find RPM packages and almost no dev packages because Ubuntu wasn't as well known and Debian was pretty small compared to Red Hat or SUSE, which both used RPMs. And at the time you had Alien, which lets you convert an RPM into a deb and generally make a mess of your system in the process. SUSE had its first version in 1994 and brought Yast for yet another setup tool, both installer and configuration tool. That made SUSE a lot easier to handle than what was available at the time. SUSE quickly moved to the RPM packaging system as well. So you see, there was a time where Linux had an almost unified and coherent packaging system. Nowadays, SUSE has a revenue of a bit less than $700 million and 2,300 employees. And Red Hat's revenue was $3.4 billion in 2018 and was bought by IBM for $34 billion in 2019. And without these two distributions, I am pretty sure that Linux would never have managed to reach the market share it has on servers nowadays. Because for companies, having services, support and commercial options is crucial. And on the other side of the fence is Debian, an old distribution dating from 1993. And that, of course, still exists today. And it's not a commercial entity, even today, all while being a big name in the Linux world. Debian's contribution to Linux is the living embodiment of the principles of open source, free software, and the community. Everything in Debian is community run, from the infrastructure, the direction the project goes in, package maintainers, documentation, everything is done by community members and voted on by them. It's the ultimate communist Linux distro. Everything is owned and run by the community itself. See, communism isn't a bad word. Another big contribution to Linux as we know it from Debian is, well, Debian itself. Debian is the base for a lot of the most popular distributions these days. Ubuntu, that's Debian based. Kali Linux, Debian. Mint, it has a Debian based version. 
And indirectly, all the Ubuntu-based distributions are also inheriting from Debian. So without Debian, we probably would not have Mint, Zorin, Elementary OS, Pop! OS and the like. And speaking of Ubuntu, it might not be the paragon of the Linux desktop it once was, but when it was introduced, it was a small revolution. It was a Linux distribution for everyone, not for computer enthusiasts. They completely flipped the script and decided to make something that anyone could install, use and keep using, instead of assuming that the only people who would even use Linux were nerds and wouldn't need help configuring anything. And I mean, I'm very obviously a nerd. I make videos on YouTube about Linux and I'm proud of it. But I also really like simplicity and yeah, Ubuntu nailed it. Ubuntu had fantastic hardware support, graphical utilities for everything. They worked hand in hand with GNOME to make this desktop more usable and more user friendly. Every new version brought improvements and big ones, not small changes. It just worked and it was compatible with Debian packages, which didn't hurt, and they really focused on making the desktop great. And a lot of these initiatives didn't pan out, like the Ubuntu One cloud syncing solution, which was awesome, or the Unity desktop, which still survives but isn't official. But these initiatives still helped make the Linux desktop move forward. Ubuntu showed that Linux could be for everyone, when most other distributions never really targeted the general public or never really focused on the user experience. Now, nowadays, of course, I would argue that Ubuntu has been largely surpassed by Linux Mint, Pop! OS, Zorin OS, and a few other distros that make using Linux a breeze. But these three distros, they wouldn't exist without Ubuntu. Another hugely influential project that made Linux wonderful is Wine. Wine is the compatibility layer that lets you run Windows programs on Linux, not through emulation or through virtual machines, but with a direct open source re-implementation of the Windows APIs that were painstakingly reverse engineered over the course of 30 years. Basically, it takes Windows calls and translates them into calls that our Linux-based operating systems can understand and execute. And Wine stands for Wine is not an emulator, which, yeah, it's another one of these things. Wine is a very important project, because without it, Proton wouldn't exist, gaming on Linux virtually wouldn't exist either, and the Steam Deck would never have been a success, or maybe would never have been introduced at all. Because Proton is based on Wine, and while it is enriched with other projects like DXVK or VKD3D that translate graphical instructions into instructions Vulkan can understand, the very base of Proton, the thing that runs the launchers, the game, and your cracked EXEs as well, you little thief, that thing is Wine. And it's insane if you think about it, because while Wine can't run all Windows programs, especially the bigger ones like Photoshop, Office and the like, its compatibility is insane when you realize that it's been developed from scratch. They basically rewrote the underlying foundation of Windows. Not too shabby and definitely a very strong influence on Linux. Linux gaming would not exist today without Wine. So there you go, nine super influential projects that helped shape Linux into the fantastic operating system we love and use today. And if you have other super important projects that I forgot, let me know down there in the comments and I'll look at it after you look at our sponsor. If you're in the market for a computer replacement and you plan to run Linux on it, maybe it's time to stop buying Windows devices and hoping that Linux will run fine on them. Maybe it's time to buy hardware that was designed specifically for Linux from our sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo is based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world and they have a big range of devices that should cover every need and every price point, whether you're looking for a laptop or a desktop, for something affordable or something ultra powerful, for something for gaming or a workstation, they have it all. All the devices are very customizable, very configurable, and all the laptops are openable, repairable, and upgradable, including the battery, the RAM, the SSD, and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer, don't buy a Windows One. Click the link in the description below and buy something from Tuxedo. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, I guess there's always that dislike button and the comment section to tell me why everything sucks. 
And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to help support it, there are plenty of links in the description below for LibraPay, Patreon, YouTube memberships, YouTube thanks, and PayPal, and the like. You know what to do. So, thanks for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!